Good. It's great to be with you. I've just been delighted to get to know the members of this congregation and see the good work you're doing in this community. Um, I'm glad to know that you guys are here. Uh, and, and the world needs to know that God's people are among them, uh, living for the Lord, uh, following His Word regardless of what the world might say, uh, believing what God says, even if the world says it's <clears throat> false. Believing what's right is right and what's wrong is wrong, even when the world gets things backwards and upside down and confused. And so I'm just grateful to know that you're here. Uh, and this place feels very welcoming and home-like to me because uh, I'm grateful to be part of a church family back home in Rona. It's very much the same way. The joy, the peace, the blessing of the Lord is being poured out uh, and overflowing. And, and I'll just tell you, the world needs what we have. And so uh, make sure that they know that this place is here, where God's people are serving Him. Um, and, uh, you know, they're folks living for the world to come, not for this life. And we're going to continue our thoughts about the topic that the, this world is not our home. And in this lesson, we're going to look at some of the special challenges that we face in our day and time. There have always been challenges to maintaining the pilgrim spirit, um, but uh, we have some, I don't know, that they're totally unique, but just some unusual things that are peculiar to our circumstances that I think we just need to be aware of so that we can mentally address them as well as uh, use the truth of Scripture uh, to face these challenges. But as we've already discussed, God doesn't just want us to get to heaven. He certainly wants us to do that. He doesn't just want to give us, give us a particular list of blessings. He wants us to be a particular kind of people. Uh, and the kind of people he wants us to be is people who can endure trials uh, while trusting in him and accomplishing his purposes. And as we've seen in many generations of human history, God's way of accomplishing that uh, and building that type of character was to make his people pilgrims or send them into the wilderness to experience solitude and silence, along with difficulty, distress, and even pain. And for us to become that kind of people today, we need to have some of the same type of experiences and then embrace the pilgrim spirit that acknowledges and celebrates the fact that the, this world is not our home. Um, and I, I just really enjoyed the song service. You guys really put your hearts into the singing of the songs. And I also want to commend the song leaders, and I don't mean to make comparisons, but you guys found more songs that had references to pilgrims than, uh, than the song leaders back home did when I preached this song. They surprised me a couple areas, some that I, songs that I forgot, but you guys found a couple more, I think, than they did. So a good job. Uh, in putting all of that together and supporting the theme of these lessons. I, I did not remember that uh, that uh, the song we just led, uh, Troublesome Times Are Here, refers to seek the way pilgrims trod, uh, but uh, that is the way we're headed, the pilgrim way that leads to, uh, to heaven, that wonderful home. So um, in this lesson, we're going to look at two mindsets that are present in our culture that challenge our pilgrim spirit, as well as two unique conditions of our society. And uh, we're going to examine their effect on us as Christians and use the truth of God's word to equip us to overcome these challenges. And the first of the mindsets I'd like for us to address is the mindset of the pursuit of happiness. The pursuit of happiness uh, is kind of part of our, our national heritage. And, uh, and so it's placed as a positive good on a par with life and liberty uh, in the same document that declared our national independence. Um, and in many ways, our nation is abandoning our founding. <laughs> and so they have abandoned the fact that it is our creator who has given us our life and liberty and the ability to pursue happiness along with unalienable rights and the whole spiritual context that gives a proper frame to uh, uh, the value of life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. But divorced from those spiritual moorings, we have managed in our culture to pursue or preserve this one 
kind of warped understanding of what the pursuit of happiness is, uh, as though it was the whole purpose of human life to kind of maximize our happiness. And um, it, that turns out not to be a very good operating principle uh, for the purpose of our lives. And so if we're affected by that as Christians, thinking that the purpose of our life is to pursue happiness, then if, if we are happy, we conclude something is wrong. Uh, we feel cheated or hindered if we're pursuing happiness but failing to achieve the amount that we expect. We avoid or seek to escape difficulty or challenging situations that may have the effect of diminishing our happiness. Uh, that may lead us to avoid the narrow way that leads to life. Uh, and uh, it may cause our sharing of the gospel to be focused more on helping others achieve maximum happiness rather than a right relationship with God. Well, what is the truth about these circumstances? Well, if our purpose uh, was really to pursue happiness, there should be a lot of information about Scripture about how to pursue happiness. Uh, but happiness is not presented as uh, the primary goal of life in Scripture. Uh, all, but the Scripture does tell us that there are things that we should be pursuing, and that is God's purposes for us. Read this passage of Scripture uh, with me in 1 Timothy 6 and verse 10. We're told the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness, and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But you, O man of God, flee these things, and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and gentleness. The things that the world is pursuing, God, uh, well, Paul tells Timothy, you should be running away from those things. But it's not just an avoidance of things that are bad, it's a pursuing of what is good. We are, our pursuit is, is directed to us from Scripture. What should we be pursuing? Righteousness, goodness, faith, love, patience, and gentleness. Well, that's what we should be pursuing, uh, not, not an empty pursuit of happiness. Similarly, in 2 Timothy 2, verse 22, we're told to flee youthful lusts, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Uh, just as our world is pursuing um, you know, physical possessions as though that was the purpose of life, but we're told to flee the love of money, our world is also pursuing lusts, as if that the satisfaction of lusts was the whole purpose of life. But once again, what the world is pursuing, we're told to flee from. I wonder who's right about that. The God who created human beings? Uh, or the world who is saying, here's what we ought to be pursuing. But it's not just a few youthful, youthful lusts. We are to pursue something. We are to be pursuing righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Well, uh, if, if we're not to be pursuing happiness uh, and pursue these other things, does that mean that uh, our lives should just be a whole heap of misery, but we've got some righteousness and love and peace. Well, actually, righteousness, love, and peace have some pretty good things associated with it. But let me ask you this. If we're not going to pursue happiness, would you like to love life? Uh, because the Scriptures do encourage us to love life. And so, are you interested in knowing what the Scriptures say about how to love life? Read this passage of Scripture. With me, it's actually a quotation from Proverbs, but in 1 Peter 3 and verse 10, Peter reminds us, He who would love life and see good days, what should he do? Let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them to do evil. <coughs> I think this passage of Scripture in Proverbs, which, which Peter quotes, is actually the background for these statements uh, that, uh, that Paul makes about what we should be pursuing. Uh, because it says here we should, uh, we should be seeking peace and pursuing it. Uh, and it's not that we're to uh, try to keep up as much misery as we can as the people of God. No, we're to love life. The way to love life, though, is to pursue God's purposes for life. And it turns out that when we're not pursuing happiness for its own sake, instead we're pursuing righteousness and peace, we end up 
getting joy along with it, something that is much more valuable than mere happiness. Uh, and that's how we can love life and how God encourages us to do exactly that. Well, another mindset of our society that uh, kind of militates or makes it hard for us to maintain our pilgrim spirit is the idea that this life is all there is. And our, uh, our culture is just simmering with this idea because our world has been completely secularized. Um, it's, unless we uh, make an effort to seek out spiritual things, we can go through not many years of our life and never bump into the idea that there's anything beyond this life, that there's any higher power greater than us that we might be responsible to uh, because our society has been kind of driving the idea of spiritual things just to the margins, to the edges of society. And so it makes it easy to forget that there is a spiritual reality. Uh, and so the idea that it's the journey and not the destination that matters. Uh, this is an idea that, uh, that uh, we have oftentimes here in our, in our culture. Um, and, you know, if, if the end of life is the end of everything, then you're right. It's, it's only our human life that matters, this journey, and so make the most along the way, because the end is a big nothing and a big void. But the reality is the destination matters a whole lot. And I'm going to read you a passage of Scripture from John uh, chapter 5, but first let's think about the consequences of viewing this life as all there is. You know, Christians, we have a fairly good understanding that there is more to come than we need to be preparing for the life to come. But it's quite possible for us to still, for us to be affected by uh, this mindset and, and for it to shade our thinking. Uh, and if we do, it can have some consequences. We can end up making fewer and fewer decisions based on eternal realities. Or we are tempted to seek political solutions or therapeutic or social answers to life's challenges instead of spiritual, moral, and biblical answers. Uh, and uh, when we are affected by this mindset, the things of the world we seem more important when compared to things not of this world. Uh, having this mindset that this world is all there is gives us, could lead us to be unwilling to take risks and make sacrifices and stand for spiritual truths and eternal realities. Uh, it can cause us to give excessive concern and attention to obtaining and securing earthly goods and less concern and attention given to obtaining and securing eternal heavenly goods. And if we're affected by the mindset that this world is all there is, we'll have little motivation to share the gospel. But the truth is very much different. Uh, there is... This, I think, is probably one of the most important things that any human being can know. And it's what Jesus said in John chapter 5, verses 25 to 29. He said, Most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, and has granted, uh, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself, and has given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Well, I'm just going to suggest to you that Regardless of how much education you may have received, or how many degrees you might have, if you don't know that there is going to come a day when every human being who has ever lived will either be raised to life or raised to condemnation, you don't know one of the most important things that you could possibly know. If we don't know this, we won't be prepared. Right? It's not just that there is a life to come after this life. It's that we're going. The our destination of this journey depends on how we live this life. God has given life to His Son and has made Him judge. 
He's the redeemer of mankind, but he's also the judge of mankind. Uh, and so how we take the journey really does matter. The, the destination is more important than the journey, but the journey is very important. Because the choices that we make in this life determine what our final destination is. And that should make sense because it's true every time we get out on the road and take our car. The choices that we make on the journey determine where we end up. Now, if this life is all there is, then there is no destination, and so it doesn't matter what turns you make. And so just, you know, choose the most scenic route. That will give you the most happiness. But if we are headed to a destination, every turn matters. You know that? Every turn matters. And, and it's not like if you make a wrong turn, you can't get right on course. But once you've made a wrong turn, there's no way to get to the destination unless you change course. Isn't that true? I mean, that's the law of physics. <laughs> once you've turned off the course, there's no way to get to your destination unless you change course. And so if there is a destination, yes, the journey is very, very important because the destination is if we want to get to the resurrection of life, we have to know which direct, where we are right now, what our direction is, and what corrections we might need to make in order to reach the destination that we intend to reach. There is no more important truth than the reality that this world is not our home. We're just passing through, and there are two destinations, not just one, where we could arrive depending on the decisions that we make every single day. Jesus came to reveal this truth and to give us a way to change course. And what a blessing that is. And he also told us important truths like this. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. If the ultimate destination that we're aiming for is heaven, it makes sense to lay up treasure there, not here in this temporary life. Uh, and that's why Paul, with this understanding, lived the life that he led and made the type of decisions that he did. He talks about this in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 7. Where he said, the things which were gained to me, these have I counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed, I count all things loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Verse 10, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection, and the fellowships of his suffering, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may obtain to the resurrection from the dead. He wanted to be part of that resurrection for life. And he knew how to get there. It was knowing Christ and being found in him. And with that knowledge, it's like the map to life, isn't it? Get in Christ and stay in Christ so you can be found in Christ and participate in the resurrection of life. Once we know that, then it's obvious what we should do. Whatever we need to do, and what, whatever, and Paul says, I've got to give up a few things in order to be in Christ and be found in Him. That's okay with me. And I had some things that I really valued, my, my uh, upbringing in, in Jewish heritage, uh, but compared to being, being part of the family of God, my Jewish heritage, you know, it's great, but being part of the family of God is even better. And so he's like, well, you know, if I have to value that less in order to value Christ more, that makes sense to me. But it doesn't make sense if we're thinking, well, this world is all there is. And that's why the people in the world around us have often are confused by us, right? Because we just have very different perspective and priority. Why would you not partake of all the sinful things that this world has to offer to really enjoy life? I intend to enjoy eternal life. And this mindset is also uh, portrayed, this true mindset is portrayed by Paul when he has this to say in 2 Corinthians 4, which is a comforting passage to me when, when folks tell me, don't you need your uh, 
I just want to take your reading glasses up there because my eyes are getting old. I was realizing that it's not just my eyes getting old, apparently. Um, but uh, I'm not the only person who's ever go grown old, apparently. And so I thank Paul for writing this for us and giving his perspective on the fact that we have physical bodies that are essentially wearing out uh, over the course of time. Paul experienced that, but this is what he said about that. 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 16, Therefore we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. When we know the truly permanent things are the spiritual things we can't see with our physical eyes, even if we had the best glasses they could possibly make, we couldn't see these true eternal realities. But through the eyes of faith, we can not just guess about these things, but we can know by the revelation of God. And knowing that changes how we look at everything, including getting older or the other burdens and trials that we might experience. The way Paul expresses it here is like every new trial is kind of like a promise that the glory that's waiting is going to be even greater than we might have expected. Because what he's sure of is that the glory that he's going to experience will so far outweigh whatever he has suffered or lost that it won't even be worth making a comparison. What an amazing perspective. It certainly is the case. This world is not our home. It certainly is not all there is. Well, we've looked at these two mindsets, the pursuit of happiness and the mindset that this world is all there is, and, and they are antagonistic to the heavenly mindset and the mindset of the pilgrim. Uh, because God is accomplishing his purpose in us and preparing us for heaven, and his purpose is not to maximize our happiness in this life, but for us to become the right kind of person. And he does lead, uh, accomplish this change in us by leading us through wilderness, this world is pilgrims. Uh, and um, in the wilderness, there's solitude and silence. That gives us opportunity for us to connect more deeply and spend time in prayer and communion with God and His Word. Uh, in the wilderness, there is sometimes loss and suffering and pain. Um, and, um, but these are things that in this life we can learn from. But I want to talk to you now about two things about our modern society and the modern culture we live in that make it hard for us to benefit from our wilderness experiences. And one is that it's, we have so many ways to avoid the solitude and silence that gives us the space to commune with God and His Word. And, um, for example, you've probably never seen this uh, picture, but... This is actually the logo for Netflix. And I was reading that uh, at one point Netflix had over 36,000 hours of content that you could stream on their service. And uh, you probably haven't seen this logo either, but actually Netflix uh, is only has one third of the content of uh, Amazon Prime. It has three times as much content as, as Netflix. And uh, this is actually the logo for YouTube. You probably haven't seen that either. But um, I was told recently that on YouTube, you know, we, we upload our sermon videos on, on YouTube, and you guys may as well. There are 500 hours of new content uploaded on YouTube every single minute. Every minute, there is 500 hours of new content added. And you know what they do with it? They tag it and index it, and then they add whatever 
they think will keep you watching to the end of the last video that you watched. And so you've got some suggestions or they'll automatically begin playing the next video for you. And over time, as you give them your you know, thumbs up and thumbs down, they'll tailor their, their suggestion list perfectly to you so that you could, if possible, spend your whole life just watching better and better content, more and more targeted to your preferences and interests until, I guess, you died. And if you did that, you would be the ideal YouTube user. But would you be the ideal you? The point of all of this is, if we need solitude and silence to grow as a Christian, it's, we're going to have to fight for it. We're going to have to seek it out. Because ways of avoiding solitude and silence are seeking us, <laughs> or constantly offering themselves. Like social media, right? I mean, we're constantly getting notifications on our phone, and, and when that dings, it might be a notice that our, our uncle is in uh, critical care and uh, in unexpectedly in a dangerous health situation, or it may be a notification that somebody's cat did something incredibly cute that we have to look at, and we don't know which unless we actually open the notification and find out what it is. And, you know, that ding may happen right in the middle of us trying to pray or read scripture. And our mind is somewhere else. Or we, if it's not, it's because we had to fight to keep our mind focused on what it was before, right? Uh, and so there's lots of ways for us to avoid or have our solitude disturbed. And so if we don't embrace and value solitude and silence, we'll almost never experience it. Uh, but although I said this is a modern problem, and they're kind of modern... <laughs> ways that uh, this is exacerbated, it turns out that this is also an ancient problem. And so I'd like for you to read with me Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 8, where the prophet there says, I would say this is probably about 2,700 years ago, Woe to those who join house to house. They add field to field till there's no place where they may dwell alone in the midst of the land. The world population has boomed in recent generations. I think I read somewhere, I don't think how, I don't think this is possibly true, but I'm going to repeat it anyway, that half the people who have ever lived are alive right now. That doesn't seem like it could possibly be true, but they, they assured me that based on the magic of exponential growth that that was true. But something like, something close to that is true. Um, and so even if it were only a quarter of the people or a tenth of the people who are lived are alive right now. Um, that's just a staggering understanding of how um, how populated, how crowded, if we're going to call it that way, the world is. But yet we find in Isaiah's day this comment made: it's hard to find a place to be alone. People tend to crowd together, uh, but we do need time alone. And that's what Jesus found as well when he came to this earth. He had to seek out time alone. In Luke chapter 5 and verse 15, we're told Jesus often withdrew into the wilderness and prayed. And in Mark chapter 1 and verse 35, we're told, Now in the morning, having risen a long while, a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. The point of these examples, and, and for us, is to Real, uh, it's just for us to consider if time with God, silence and solitude is helpful to us in remaining spiritually connected, we're going to have to seek it out and we're going to have to fight for it because our world is crowding it out. And so if we just act naturally in the world, in this very unnatural world in which we live, we'll find very little opportunity for these things. And let me also say, we also need community. <laughs> we need some solitude and silence, time alone with God, but we also need each other. And so we need a balance of both. It's not all one or all the other. The scriptures tell us a man who isolates himself seeks his own desire. Uh, and so there's uh, it's foolishness to be isolated all the time. That's, that's from Proverbs chapter 17. Uh, we need both, but what I'm saying is, 
you know, the world we live in now, one of the harder things to find is actually the solitude and silence. Uh, and then with, reg with regard to pain and distress, we have so many ways to escape that as well. Uh, and, and so let's talk about that. Uh, uh, one of the ways that we escape uh, pain and distress is, is through food. Now, if, we're, if uh, we have pain in our belly because we're hungry, the natural solution for that is to eat good food. And that's what we ought to do uh, when we're hungry, uh, if we're able to do that. Uh, but, uh, but consuming food is a way to escape pain and distress. That's not the purpose of food. And I have on here food and edible concentrated markers of food. I think everyone's heard of food. You may not be aware of, of what edible concentrated markers of food is. What that's referring to is that in the food that we eat and that, that God made and put on earth, uh, there are markers in the food that let us know that it's something good for us. And so uh, the fruit on the tree has a uh, beautiful color and uh, pleasant taste and sweetness that is connected with, uh, in that fruit, with the nutrition of that pear or that uh, strawberry and so forth. Uh, and uh, and uh, the, the meat that we eat uh, has salts in them that, that have a savory flavor that let us know that we're getting uh, protein and other nutrients that are connected with that food. Uh, but it's possible for those markers of food to be removed from the nutrition and placed in concentrated forms and you probably have never seen this done, but every once in a while I'll see something like this on the left. I believe those are called Skittles, but they look a lot like fruit, don't they? And if, if you put one in your mouth, it tastes a lot like fruit. In fact, you can choose what color you want. There's different flavors based on the, on the color, but I don't know if you know this, but there's not much nutrition in those Skittles, are there? That's what I mean by edible concentrated markers of food. The markers are there, but the nutrients aren't, um, and that's why you'll never see me eating Skittles. No, well, actually, they want something else to do. Oh, I, uh oh, it, was, it gave me away. She had a shock expression on her face that I would say something like that. I can't hide the truth from you guys. All right, and uh, these are Doritos. I don't know if you've seen them. Uh, here we have something that tastes like it must be full of nutrition, right? When you put one of those in your mouth, your taste buds are saying, this is exactly what I need. Finally, you've given me something really good. At least that's what my taste buds tell me uh, when I eat Doritos. And yet, if I look on the package, I, the, the protein and nutrition, the, 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 I feel like I just must have consumed isn't there. So, again, uh, be careful what you eat, right? Um, and using these things as an escape is not, it's going to, going to be helpful at all, right? If it doesn't even have the nutrition associated with it. Well, another way that we have to escape pain and suffering is through chemicals, whether it's drugs or alcohol, painkillers, antidepressants, mood stabilizers, sleeping pills, nicotine, and marijuana. Uh, and I know that there are drugs that, uh, that are needed and helpful under certain circumstances, um, but we created a society in which we have kind of an expectation that no matter what we're going through, that there's probably some pill or something that is going to keep us from having to experience any pain or challenge or difficulty. Uh, and in some cases, that's true. I mean, some of these painkillers, they take away your pain. <laughs> and, uh, and just the experience of being pain-free becomes something that, that some people are entrapped by and are driven steal medication, or they're addicted to the particular painkillers, and I've, seen, I've personally seen lives destroyed um, by the effects, unintended effects, of these drugs that were intended to help those who are in the most desperate, uh, painful circumstances. Um, and so, another way that we have to escape pain and distress is through digital experiences that trigger the reward centers of our brains. Uh, we were, uh, this would include uh, video games and virtual reality and pornography, which uh, entraps many. Uh, and one of the reasons that it's entrapping is because your brain is being told this is exactly what you need and you're locked into that 
trapped in sin. Uh, the problem is you may have escaped some troubling situation, but how are you going to escape your way of escape? And of course, there's endless other forms of entertainment and escape. And with all these choices, uh, if we get sated or bored of, of one of these ways of escape, we just cycle to the next or let our social media influencers tell us what the next escape that we just have to experience is going to be. But what's the alternative to these ways of dealing with pain and distress? Well, think about this statement by God in Psalm 15, verse 15. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. In most circumstances, the way to overcome distress is not to escape it, but to persevere through it with God's help. And when we reach the other side with God's help, we're, it turns out we're more dependent on Him, which is actually good for us. But when we escape pain and distress with the help of food or chemicals or digital distractions, we end up more dependent on them, which is not good for us. Sometimes we use the phrase coping mechanism for how we deal with the challenges of life. Whatever we use to deal with the challenges of life, we will become more dependent on. That makes sense. The question is, what do we want to end up depending on to deal with the distresses of life? We depend on these things, we become more dependent on them, and that's not good for us. But if we become more dependent on God to get through our troubles, that actually is the best thing that could possibly happen to us. And in fact, one of the purposes of the challenges that we face, as we saw in all of our previous studies, is to bring us to a point where we are more fully dependent on God. And so, we don't have to escape. God's way is not escape, but through the challenges and difficulties of this life. And we close with this passage of scripture from Paul. We'll use him as a case study in 2 Corinthians 12, verses 7 through 10. Uh, and he reveals in this passage of scripture that um, he had a challenge that he faced. He refers to it as a thorn in the flesh, and we don't know for sure what that was involved. Some suggested that he may have had some vision uh, problems. I believe he said to the Galatians that if possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given to them, given them to me, if you could have. And so it may have been an eye problem or some other uh, physical condition. Uh, but Paul says here in 2 Corinthians, he that lest I be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it may depart from me. And he said, my grace is sufficient. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will most gladly rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. For most of human history, the, there were a lot of challenges of life. There wasn't an easy solution. And people uh, trusted the Lord. Uh, or just dealt with the despair, the incurable, hopeless situation brought into their life. Here, God, uh, you know, had dealt in a very special way with Paul. And so Paul felt like he was in a position to say, Lord, I can do so much more for you. If I didn't have this thorn in the flesh, please remove it from me. And yet the answer of Jesus was, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. And Paul was able to reach the point where he was able to say, I can boast about my sufferings. I can glory in suffering. Um, and in reality, he could see how being weak enabled him in Christ to be strong. You know, this lesson has been 
helpful to you. Uh, there are some special challenges to the pilgrim spirit in our day and time. The idea that the pursuit of happiness with this world is all there is. And we're flooded with ways of avoiding silence and solitude and ways of escaping pain and distress. Um, and so it makes it easy for us to kind of avoid the lessons that God might be able to give by bringing us through our challenges and difficulties. But that is his intention. Um, and it is to place us in a position where we can experience what we truly want, which is a place where there is no sorrow, no death, no crying. That is our heavenly home. That is our home. This world is not our home, but that heaven is our true home. And that is what is waiting for us. Uh, and, and when we are looking at this life from a heavenly perspective, it's, it's, it's not that we're hoping for and expecting trouble and difficulty around every corner, but it's because we have confidence that we can overcome that gives us the freedom to enjoy things that we otherwise couldn't enjoy. We're able to stop and smell the roses. We're able to appreciate a good night's sleep when we get one. Appreciate a sunrise. Appreciate uh, the love and fellowship of our brothers and sisters in Christ. And we find in the midst of and in spite of our trials and difficulties, joy and peace, fulfillment, confidence, and hope. And that is the beautiful life that we are called to be as Christians. Not a life that's free from challenge and difficulty, but a life in which we're overcome by our faith in Jesus Christ. That's what I see in this congregation. Very encouraging to me to be here this week. Thank you for the invitation. And we want to extend the Lord's invitation at this time. Uh, if you're not on this path, the path that leads to heaven, remember it. There is a resurrection, condemnation, the resurrection of life. And the only way to get to that goal is to either start in that direction and never turn aside, or if you have turned aside, turn back. And the message of the gospel is all have sinned, all have turned aside, but all can turn back because of what Jesus did on the cross. He shed his blood to pay for the price of our sins. And so if we turn by repenting of our sins, confess our faith in Jesus Christ, and are baptized in his name, and all our sins are washed away, then by continuing to turn towards him, and when we get off course and make the correction, we will reach our heavenly home, and that's God's intention for us. If you desire to be a child of God this morning, obey the gospel, have the opportunity at this time, let's